Hi, I'm Rashonda Cave. This is Reading with Rashonda. We are reading Clotel by William Wells Brown. We're on chapter 27. We are in the home stretch. There are only 29 chapters. We're on chapter 27. Woohoo! All right, let's dive in. Chapter 27, The Mystery. George, however, did not forget his promise to use all the means in his power to get Mary out of slavery. He therefore labored with all his might to obtain money with which to employ someone to go back to Virginia for Mary. After nearly six months labor at St. Catherine's, he employed an English missionary to go and see if the girl could be purchased and at what price. The missionary went accordingly, but returned with the sad intelligence that, on account of Mary's aiding George to escape, the court had compelled Mr. Green to sell her out of state and she had been sold to a Negro trader and taken to the New Orleans market. Oh, we've talked about the New Orleans market. Oh. As all hope of getting the girl was now gone, George resolved to quit the American continent forever. He immediately took passage in a vessel laden with timber bound for Liverpool, and in five weeks from that time, he was standing on the quay of the great English seaport. With little or no education, he found many difficulties in the way of getting respectable living. However, he obtained a situation as porter in a large house in Manchester where he worked during the day and took private lessons at night. In this way, he labored for three years and was then raised to the situation of clerk. George was so white as easily to pass for a white man, and being somewhat ashamed of his African descent, he never once mentioned the fact of his having been a slave. And my guess is he was ashamed of having been a slave and therefore was ashamed of his African descent. If people of African descent had not been slaves, he would have had no reason to have been ashamed. All right, let's keep reading. He soon became a partner in the firm that employed him and was now on the road to wealth. In the year 1842, just 10 years after George Green, for he adopted his master's name, arrived in England, he visited France and spent some time at Dunkirk. It was towards sunset on a warm day in the month of October that Mr. Green, notice that he's now called Mr. Green. He's a white man now. He gets the title of Mr. Now. All right. Uh, it was towards sunset on a warm day in the month of October that Mr. Green was strolling some distance from the Hotel de Leon, entered a burial ground, and wandered long alone among the silent dead, gazing upon the many green graves and marble tombstones of those who once moved in the theater of busy life and whose sounds of gaiety once fell upon the ear of man. All nature around was hushed in silence and seemed to partake of the general melancholy which hung over the quiet resting place of departed mortals. After tracing the varied inscriptions which told the characters or conditions of the departed and viewing the mounds beneath which the dust of mortality slumbered, he had now reached a secluded spot near to where an aged weeping willow bowed its thick foliage to the ground as though anxious to hide from the scrutinizing gaze of curiosity the grave beneath it. Mr. Green seated himself upon a marble tomb and began to read Roscoe's Leo the Tenth, a copy of which he had under his arm. It was then about twilight, and he had scarcely gone through half a page when he observed a lady in black, leading a boy, some five years old, up one of the paths. And as the lady's black veil was over her face, he felt somewhat at liberty to eye her more closely. While looking at her, the lady gave a scream and appeared to be in a fainting position when Mr. Green sprang from his seat in time to save her from falling to the ground. At this moment, an elderly gentleman was seen approaching with a rapid step who, from his appearance, was evidently the lady's father or one intimately connected with her. He came up and in a confused manner asked what was the matter. Mr. Green explained as well as he could. After taking up the smelling bottle which had fallen from her hand and holding it a short time to her face, she soon began to revive. During all this time, the lady's veil had so covered her face that Mr. Green had not seen it. When she had so far recovered as to be able to raise her head, she again screamed and fell back into the arms of the old man. It now appeared quite certain that either the countenance of George Green or some other object was the cause of these fits of fainting. And the old gentleman, thinking it was the former, in rather a petulant tone said, I will thank you, sir, if you will leave us alone. The child whom the lady was leading had now set up a squall, and, among, and amid the death-like appearance of the lady, the harsh look of the old man, and the cries of the boy, 
Mr. Green left the grounds and returned to his hotel. While seated by the window and looking out upon the crowded street, with every now and then the strange scene in the graveyard vividly before him, Mr. Green thought of the book he had been reading. And remembering that he had left it on the tomb where he had suddenly dropped it when called to the assistance of the lady, he immediately determined to return in search of it. After a walk of some twenty minutes, he was again over the spot where he had been an hour before, and from which he had been so unceremoniously expelled by the old man. He looked in vain for the book. It was nowhere to be found. Nothing save the bouquet which the lady had dropped, and which lay half buried in the grass from having been trodden upon, indicated that any one had been there that evening. Mr. Green took up the bunch of flowers, and again returned to the hotel. After passing a sleepless night and hearing the clock strike six, he dropped into a sweet sleep from which he did not awake until roused by the rap of a servant who, entering his room, handed him a note which ran as follows. Sir, I owe you an apology for the inconvenience to which you were subjected last evening, and if you will honor us with your presence to dinner today at four o'clock, I shall be most happy to give you due satisfaction. My servant will be waiting for you at half past three. I am, sir, your obedient servant, J. Dovna, October 23rd, to George Green, Esquire. The servant who handed this note to Mr. Green informed him that the bearer was waiting for a reply. He immediately resolved to accept the invitation and replied accordingly. Who this person was and how his name and the hotel where he was stopping had been found out was indeed a mystery. However, he waited impatiently for the hour when he was to see this new acquaintance and get the mysterious meeting in the graveyard solved. I'm going to stop there. Next up is chapter 28. Let's see what happens as we wrap up Clotel by William Wells Brown. This is Reading with Rashonda, and I'm Rashonda Cade.